Good morning. Welcome to everyone God has gathered up here to worship this day. Whether you're here with us in the sanctuary in person or you're joining us by the live stream or on the radio broadcast, we're glad you're here with us today. And we're glad to have this time together to consider how we respond best to God's expectations of us rather than those expectations of the world. And we are glad to today welcome a new worship host, Logan Almeida. We are glad to have Mike Mangan here to lead our music and our songs and hymns. And we are also blessed to have Cindy Recheck as our worship manager out in um, the entryway. See her if you need something between the services. Thank you to all of our ushers and greeters and to our tech support crew up in the balcony as well. We are blessed by everybody's gift shared in this place. And now let us breathe in God's presence and center ourselves as we turn to Mike to lead us in our opening hymn. Let's stand and join together in United Methodist Hymnal number 696, America the Beautiful. skies for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesty above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and cried Please join me for the call to worship. Stand if you are able. Holy is our God who calls us to worship by pausing in our daily lives. Mighty is our God who calls us to lead courageously and to follow faithfully. Loving is our God who calls us to live lives of service and love. Worship the Lord. Please join me in the opening prayer. O God, o God our, our Creator, creator Lead us in the way you would have us go. Lead us into your presence this day. Guide us in our time of worship that we may hear your word and answer your call. In your light and in your truth, we pray. We have come to the time in the service. We are going to hear a wonderful musical gift, a special musical gift, entitled Irish Air. We have Kit Ullman, accompanied by Mike Mangan. Thank you for the music you share with us.
Thank you so much, Kit and Mike, for that wonderful message through music to all of us this morning. Thank you for your ministry. May we speak together as your children the words of prayer your son taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Mark. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all of this? What's this wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. Jesus said to them, Prophets are honored everywhere except for in their own hometowns, among their relatives, and in their own households. He was unable to do any miracles there except that he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was appalled by their disbelief, and Jesus traveled through the surrounding villages teaching. He called for the twelve and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey, except a walking stick, no bread, no bags, and no money in their belts. He told them to wear sandals, but to not put on two shirts. He said, whatever house you enter, remain there until you leave that place. If a place doesn't welcome you or listen to you, as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a witness against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should change their hearts and lives. They cast out many demons as they anointed many sick people with olive oil and healed them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Logan. Well, how many of us here grew up in what we would term to be a small town? Lots of us. Lots of us. And sometimes even parts of a big city become a small community, a neighborhood where everybody begins to know each other. Because that's what we think of small communities, small towns mean that everybody will know each other or at least we think we do. It can be great to feel like everybody knows everybody, but there can also be some downsides. And there are all kinds of expressions that we've come up with that express that idea. We'll say that a son that looks like his dad or acts like his dad, before we even get to know him, we'll say, he's a chip off the old block. Who's heard that one? Yes, common one. And when a young person does something great or does something of concern, we'll express our lack of surprise by saying the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? We've got that one too. It's hard, hard to live beyond the expectations of people who believe they know us, who believe they know us, who feel as though they've known us forever, but that can also be really hard, especially if those folks have never bothered to get to know us as individuals, as the people that we are, because they're operating on who they think we are. And that is exactly what happens to Jesus in this passage that Logan just read for us. Jesus was a small town boy, and this part of Mark goes from when he's been healing people all over the region of Galilee, people who have faith in him, people who trust their lives to him, this passage takes us back to his hometown of Nazareth. And apparently there everybody thinks they know him. Historians believe that Nazareth, Nazareth was probably about 400 people at that time. Who can envision a town of about 400 people? We have to kind of not blink too much when we drive through or we miss them sometimes. Uh, 
So we can imagine the people of this small town in the synagogue listening to Jesus read scripture and then comment on it and tell them that he's giving them God's word. And you can see and imagine what they're saying to each other back in the benches or pews. Isn't that Mary's son? What is he saying? What does he mean? This is a word from the Lord. Maybe they remembered or said to each other that Mary had to get married. They're remembering that about Jesus' history. And they're probably also commenting on Jesus as Mary's oldest son who is not staying home in Nazareth to take care of her and be the community carpenter to run the family business now that Joseph has died. And we also remember that chapter 3 in this gospel where Jesus' family tries to stop him from wandering around and preaching because that's the behavior of a crazy person. And they try to get him to give that up. Most likely that family disagreement was a bit discussed in this small town. And I suspect the sympathy was with his family rather than with Jesus, the wandering preacher. So here we have the Son of God in this account with people who can only see him through a lens of believing that he should be just like them. Because he's from them, isn't he? Didn't he grow up right there? Now we, we know Jesus came to be both human and divine as God's Son. We know differently. But those people of Nazareth don't know that yet. We know that Mary, his mother, understood that. And we have evidence in scripture that at least two of his brothers, James and Jude, became his disciples later. But that wasn't until after his death and resurrection and all that happened within that that helped, him helped those brothers understand who he really was. But as a whole community, Nazareth is a community of traditional Jewish believers who miss the presence of the Son of God when he's right there in front of them because they couldn't see Jesus beyond their own expectations of who he was, who he was supposed to be. He was supposed to stay home and take care of Mary and be the carpenter in town. And he wasn't doing that. So they likely were disappointed in him. Here's a great example of how our expectations sometimes put limits on how we respond to each other as human beings. We sometimes fail to encourage and support each other when we can't imagine the possibilities that God has in store for the lives of others in our midst. And we miss seeing incredible gifts that need to be lifted up and affirmed and strengthened. And sometimes people even have to work against the limits that we place on them because of what they've done. And other times they're working against who we believe that they are. We have a lot of trouble giving one another a clean slate, even though God is ready to do that for us anytime we ask God to forgive us. But we as human beings struggle to forgive the mistakes that we make that hurt each other. I believe that God asks us to forgive each other even when we can't forget the wrong that's been done. God asks us to forgive, not necessarily forget. But what do we do with admonitions like, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me? We say things like that. Sometimes we don't forgive someone because we need to protect ourselves. And there's a delicate balance in finding the way that we'll be sensibly safe with someone that's hurt us in the past and offering God's transformation a chance to work in their life and make them someone completely different than they have been ever before. 
if God is working within someone, we have to figure out how to let them try again and do something completely new, even if they've hurt us or wronged us. And that isn't easy. Now, Jesus most likely hadn't even hurt or wronged too many people in that community, and they won't even give his ministry a chance there in that passage. We need to remember, though, that sometimes God works through us to offer a helping hand and encouragement for the gifts placed within any of us. Now, that doesn't mean when we see someone who's walked a difficult journey that we need to suddenly enable or solve their problems for them. We have to give them space to let them truly feel God's power and prodding to make change because it's only the change someone chooses for themselves and makes with determination that will truly last. And that's what God's transformation is really about. A change that will last. A change in someone's life that makes them entirely a new person in the world. One parishioner at a past church I served had lived on the streets of Milwaukee as an addict, but he's now spending his days as an AODA counselor helping others find their way out of addiction because God created within him a heart that always puts others first, and he has the will to do that. But he had to resolve his own addiction issues first before he could begin any kind of helping others. And he managed to do that with God's help. But then he also realized that he was going to have to start his counseling career on the other side of the city because where he had been on the streets couldn't get past his history and understand that he was someone new. He needed a track record of a clean life and actual helping others in counseling, a record as a counselor before he could ever walk back to the other side of Milwaukee and provide help to anyone in the neighborhood where he, did, he had been on the streets as an addict. God's transformation got him through all of that, and today he is one of the most well-known counselors in the city of Milwaukee and can help anyone because now he has lived on past his history and people understand God has made him new and transformation has happened. A married couple at another church I served struggled to live through infidelity on both their parts, infidelity in their marriage. And all their friends thought they should separate. That was the advice of so many who surrounded them. But they felt that each, each of the other of them was God's gift to them somehow in their lives. And it took tremendous prayer and forgiveness for them to stay together but with God's help, they defied all of the human expectations and advice around them. And the last I knew, they were still together, changed and new, finding new life for their marriage and for their family and for their lives. How often do we limit what God has in mind for us? Because we can't imagine what God will do with someone we believe we know someone that we've got a track record with, that we believe we know who they are. And yet God has something else entirely different in store. Because we don't imagine big enough in terms of what God could do in any of our lives. And our human expectations put limits on what we expect of others. But what if we go beyond our human expectations to deal with God's expectations? That's what God really desires in our relationships with one another, that we look beyond all of our outer experience and come to know what's in somebody's heart. Now, nobody taught or encouraged Jesus to go about preaching and teaching telling the world about God's love, healing people into the fullness of the life God intended them to have. His family didn't encourage or support him, but that is what God created him to do. And I think 
this passage points out to us that no one in Nazareth must have ever even have had a conversation with Jesus about what mattered most to him. If what he said in the synagogue was a surprise to all of them, they must have missed any conversation that really told them what was going on in his heart and what he intended to do with his life and why he believed he'd been placed on the earth. If that was truly a surprise to them, Jesus was right to say, if someone isn't ready to receive your message, shake the dust off your feet and move on. That's what he says in the second half of that passage. Because he understood that they were not going to be able to hear him. I pray that we can do a better job as a congregation than that congregation Jesus spoke to so long ago of hearing one another with our hearts and looking beyond our human expectations to say, what does God expect of us as people who walk the journey of following Jesus Christ together? God calls us to look beyond our exteriors, our past experiences, and to find new life in relationships that we have together. God calls us to listen well to one another with our hearts, to sort out what we love, what we hope for, what we have faith in, and what brings us joy. Let's not miss that in conversation with each other. Let's not miss those things in relationship with one another, like that congregation in Jesus' hometown did so long ago. We have opportunity to know what's in one another's hearts if we listen well to each other. So literally, we're going to start making that happen today. You have an assignment. Look out. Ready? So in that time right after the benediction, where you begin to think, how fast can I get out the door? Or how fast can I get to the cookies and coffee? Or where is so-and-so? I need to talk to them about something all those things we do at the end of the benediction. Instead, let's look around the sanctuary and get in groups of two or three, leaving no one out, and each name one thing that brought you joy in this last week. Think of one thing that brought you joy, because that's an easy place to start. And if you, by some chance, don't happen to know each other's names and feel really brave, introduce yourself and ask the other person's name. That could also be a step in that direction of getting acquainted and being in relationship with each other. So let's think about that. Think about that as we go on through our service. What brought you joy this week? You can sum that up in one word or a story of what brought you joy. And we have opportunity to continue to open our hearts and listen with our hearts to each other so that we know what God expects us to do for each other, so that we have a chance to practice that, rather than those barriers we put up between us as humans. Let's find a way to listen to each other the way God listens to each of us. As we follow Jesus Christ together, God will help us with that. Amen. Stand and join together in our song out of the faith we sing hymnal number 2197, Lord of all hopefulness.
hands and give us, we pray, your strength in our hearts, Lord, at the noon of the day. Lord of all kindliness, Lord of all grace, your hands swift to welcome, your arms to embrace. Be there at our homing and give us, we pray, your love in our hearts, Lord, at the eve of the day. Lord of all gentleness, Lord of all calm, whose voice is contentment, whose presence is balm, be there at our sleeping and give us, we pray, your peace in our hearts, Lord, at the end of the day. Please be seated. As we come now to the time in our service, we have opportunity to reflect on the fact that everything we have in the world is, comes from God. And what we offer back to God is our grateful response for all that God has given us. May we generously respond and may we listen to Kit playing Great Are You, Lord, for our offertory music. Thank you. together in our closing song number 568 from the United Methodist Hymnal, Christ for the World We Sing. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with loving zeal, the poor and them that mourn the faint in sick and sorrow on whom Christ doth heal. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring. With fervent prayer, the wayward and the lost by reckless passions tossed, redeemed at God, lost from 
dark despair. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring. With one accord, with us the work to share, with us reproach to dare, with us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with joyful song, the newborn souls whose days we claim from error's ways, inspired with hope and praise to Christ we long. Don't forget your assignment. My joy today is to work with a new worship host. Thank you, Logan, for the morning. Thank you so much. No problem. And now, friends, as we go from this place, may we consider what God sees within each of us and look for that in each other every opportunity we have in the ministry, in the days ahead. May we lift up what God has placed within each of us that needs encouragement. Amen. Thank you.